Anyway, I'm going to talk to you today about a project which uh, uh, we've been doing at Cardiff University. My colleague Bettina Bockelman, she runs this project, the whole project as a whole. My colleague Razor Amadian does all the research, and I just give the talks and have an easy life. <coughs> anyway, we're going to talk about the work we've been doing on the Sem Barrage. We're doing quite a bit of work on uh, this project as a whole, but mainly barrages and impoundments, and we've been mainly looking at an impoundment in Wales, and uh, we've not progressed as much as we would have liked on impoundments in North Wales, because my colleague Stuart Anderson is here. I'm delighted that Stuart's here from the North Wales uh, uh, fraternity, and no doubt there will be questions on that later. Um, so I'm going to talk about the latest Seven Barrage project, because this has uh, quite a lot of interest. This work was funded by Maren, and this um, work has been done by Maren, and Reza Mardin unfortunately can't be here today. He hasn't been able to get a visa. So let me discuss firstly some of the key considerations, which I think are quite relevant for us uh, in terms of um, um, marine renewable energy, and in particular, uh, tidal as we're talking about here. I've been going to China for the last, um, well, the first point is on the growing worldwide interest in energy demand, and particularly in dynamic economies. I've been going to China for the last 30 odd years, and one of the things I found was uh, when I meet politicians and so forth who are now going out in the widest context, politicians, business people, councillors and so forth, and they've been going to China for the last uh, 30 years, and they come back and say we have no hope of meeting our targets and so forth, because even if we meet our targets, and of course they don't include that in that virtual carbon, because we might meet our targets in the UK, but of course we're buying all these products that are produced in China, where the carbon footprint in China is effectively our, where, where we buy the products is virtually our virtual carbon footprint. And they stay in their uh, <coughs> McEwer Marriott hotels and so forth, and they look out from the 13th floor and see all the, the, the fossil fuels being burnt and so forth. And um, when you go to the home of a doctor or a dentist or a professor or whatever in China living south of the Yangtze, it can still be colder than here in the winter. There's no heating in the home and there's no hot water. And 60 years ago, when I was, 61 years now, when I was born in West Wales, we had, um, we had hot water in the home and so forth. So what the Chinese people are wanting today is no different from we, what we took for granted 61 years ago in Wales and Ireland and so forth. And yet, if you listen to the politicians, the problem with meeting the targets and so forth is all because of the Indians and the Chinese and so forth in these dynamic economies. So we mustn't forget those points. And then we come to climate change, where we all talk very enthusiastically about climate change and how we've got to address the problems of climate change. And nobody really wants to talk about population growth except the influx of people from Eastern Europe into Britain, for example. But notwithstanding that, in my country, we're going to have an increase. Oh, and the perception is that the only uh, population growth is going to occur in Africa, Bangladesh, and India, and China, uh, uh, and, um, uh, and, and um, Pakistan, for example. But even in my country, and notwithstanding the influx, possible influx from Eastern Europe, we're going to have a 10 million population growth over the next uh, 20 years. The world's population is going to go up from 6.5 billion to 8 billion over the next 20 years. We're going to need 50% more food, we're going to need 30% more water, and 30% more electricity. So we have uh, that as a key challenge for the future as well. So it's not just a matter of meeting the demands of today, but the demands in 20 years from now, and that's a huge challenge for us. Then we've got the demands from decarbonisation. So as we switch to electric cars, we're going to need more electricity. We have EU targets to meet, and we can't ignore the virtual carbon footprint that we're going to create. And then we look to tidal energy, which has the real attraction over wind, in my view. That's not to say we shouldn't be investing in wind as well. But the big advantage of uh, tidal energy is that it is predictable. And that makes energy, tidal energy very attractive to the engineer. If you just take, for example, the Semneshi, which I'll come on to in a minute, there's huge potential energy there for us to capture. Uh, but that's very much tidal dependent, uh, and spring tide dependent in particular. And that we can predict. We can predict it today, we can predict it tomorrow, we can predict it next week, and we predict it next year, and so on. And we can predict that to occur, what occurs at 4 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, 
and we can fit that to match the peak spring tide between January and March so that it coincides with a Wales-England football match, for example, rugby match, for example. And we can play our Wales-England football match to match that peak spring tide at four o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. So the fact that it's predictable makes it very attractive to the engineer. And the seven estuary, the Bay of Fundy is not attractive for tidal energy for a whole host of reasons. It has wave amplification effects in New York and Boston in particular, and in New York it would almost certainly have a Fukushima effect on the power station which produces all the power for New York. So the Seven Ashley then becomes the most attractive site in the world for uh, power which I'll talk about in a minute. Okay, so now when we go on to look at power, we know that the Seven Ashley has the second highest rise in fall of tide in the world. You could split hairs over that and say it's a third because there are two sites in the Bay of Fundy. And we know that H squared, oh sorry, we know uh, that H, the power is proportional to the square of the tide, effectively the tidal range. The water, H is the water level difference either side of the barrage uh, or the impoundment wall. What people, in my experience, when you talk to the public, don't appreciate that A comes into this equation as well. Now, A is the planned surface, wetted planned surface area. So if you fly in a SEM 4 SEM, for example, over the 7 Ashley, A here is the water level, the impounded planned surface area, the water level upstream of the, of the uh, of the, of the impoundment in the estuary. So in the case of the Seven Estuary, we have A equal to 500 square kilometers. This is a very large value for this uh, parameter A here. So in the case of the Seven Estuary, we create a huge amount of power. If we build a barrage from Cardiff to Western, I'll show you a sketch as to where that is in a minute. So I'm just trying to point out why the Seven is particularly attractive. And this A equates to one and a half times the size of Lake Garda, one of the largest lakes in Europe. So when we look at the map of Britain, for example, then this estuary is streets ahead of any other estuary in terms of its potential to create enormous amounts of power for us from, from the tide. Now, back in the first possibility of building a barrage across this estuary occurred 150 years ago with a person called Thomas Fulljams, and he wanted to build a barrage across this estuary mainly for communication, uh, rail communication between... Where, okay, I got your point. Wales and England, this man won't let me move. <coughs> um, but in the 80s, and there have been a lot of studies since, but in the 80s there was a scheme first proposed by the Seven Tidal Power Group it was very expensive at that time, but it came back to the fore in, in, the, uh, in the early part of this, uh, this current century. And I was quite heavily involved in this scheme and promoted this scheme quite heavily. And uh, it has second, uh, all the facts are given there, 5% of the UK's electricity. Just to put that into context, that would be enough power for the whole of Wales. It wouldn't be as simple as that, of course. But to put it into a realistic context, about three million, just under 3 million people living in Wales, and that would be enough power uh, theoretically for the whole of Wales. Uh, it would save 7 million tonnes of carbon and at that time it would uh, cost 20 billion pounds. About 21 billion euros. And this went from just southwest of Cardiff to, to uh, just south of uh, Western Supermare. Now this scheme was uh, based on ebb tide generation only and when the studies were previously done it was shown that ebb tide generation only generated the most uh, power. And we had sluice gates here. Uh, a third of the wall was basically turbines, and the other third was uh, uh, sluice gates. 166 sluice gates, 216 turbines generating 17 terawatt hours per year. And it significantly changed the tide. As the tide came into the Ashley, the blue line here shows the tide, and the red line shows the tide after it's passed the barrage. So the water's held for three hours, and then you can see a very large tidal, uh, uh, tidal head uh, 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 between the upstream and the downstream side. So if you were a fish going through the turbine, you've got a very large head to uh, uh, swim against here, for example. And if you look at the um, shape uh, schematic sketch here of the tide, you can see that the groundwater level is going to be raised quite significantly. Uh, that means you're going to have quite a lot of salt water intrusion into the groundwater. You'll have lower peak water levels upstream. The yellow line is below the blue line, so you'll protect properties from flooding. 
but you will raise the groundwater level and you will have significant loss of intertidal habitats. So this scheme, uh, the government, this scheme was to be funded publicly <laughs> at the time and the government uh, commissioned a major investigation into a whole range of schemes in the seven estuary and ultimately concluded that this was still the best and the cheapest scheme. So we did quite a lot of studies in this and we used our far field model, which I'll come on to in a minute, to give us boundary conditions to drive the, uh, an unstructured grid finite volume model here to look at uh, flows in the estuary. And this went all the way up to the tidal limit, which is past, well past Newnham and Gloucester. And then we looked at simulations with and without the barrage. So here you can see the flow coming through the sluice gates no power being produced through the sluice gates, obviously, and in that part of the wall, uh, both on the left third and the right third here, uh, slow flow through the turbines. And then on the outgoing tide, no power being produced again through the left third and the right third, but a lot of power being produced through the middle third where the turbines are located. Now, I had a good, I've always had a good relationship with the RSPB, but they bitterly opposed this scheme, and so too did the Friends of the Earth and many of the other NGOs. And uh, the RSPB pointed out to me as an engineer, this is a disastrous design. And when you look at it with the uh, uh, concept of the, the uh, uh, Hans Andersen story, it, it is rather obvious that you're missing the obvious here, because you're only producing power through the middle third of this wall. So you're wasting all this wall to produce power. Anyway, the main effects of the barrage were to reduce the tidal range from 14 to 7 metres, uh, big loss of intertidal uh, habitats of 14 uh, square kilometres, reduce the currents dramatically both upstream and downstream, so you're going to change the estuary characteristics dramatically. Suspended sediments and turbidity levels will drop dramatically as well. They're roughly proportional to the third power of velocity. Depends which equation you use. The light penetration will increase significantly and you will change the benthic flora and fauna. The tidal range will still be seven metres, making this still a macro tidal estuary with a bigger tidal range than any other estuary in the UK. And this scheme was one in the studies that the government looked at, which the RSPB were quite sympathetic towards. They liked it for a number of reasons. It had low head turbines, so, um, so the tidal range across this turbine was quite low. And the other advantage, as I saw it, the end, from the engineer's perspective, this is not a very attractive scheme because it's based on the siphon, and the siphon has a whole host of problems. But putting the engineering aside, and working with the RSPB back in about 2008, I could see a lot of advantage in this scheme, particularly that the turbines were going all the way across the estuary. Uh, sorry, all the way across the wall. And of course, you're keeping the, uh, the shape of the, the two-way generation and so forth. And we had a lot of discussions with uh, Stuart Anderson as well on this. And, and, uh, and I'm sure in our separate discussions, a lot will come up again about, the, about pumping. And certainly with the goons, there's a lot of attractions in pumping. But I won't dwell on that now. Anyway, we went, then went on to modify the design of this turbine, putting in 1,026 turbines. The turbines are now included all the way across this wall. This is the latest scheme, the Havering Power scheme. It's on the Havering Power website, uh, www.haveringpower.com. And it creates, we've now done a lot of work on the design of this scheme so that we can create pretty well exactly the same amount of power as the ebb tide generation only. There are no sluice gates. The wall is slightly longer. It cost 25 uh, billion, uh, that's probably gone up a bit now, and it's 7.2 million tonnes of carbon. And here you can see the advantage of two-way generation that you're creating four pulses in the lunar 24-hour day instead of two. And you, the peak is lower, but it produces power uh, over a longer period as well during the lunar day. So we had another problem in that the... STBG scheme, as reported in the original deck studies, which came out in 2010 and was involved in those studies as well, showed that the scheme had considerable far field effects. Now, in the original um, studies carried out for the deck, the HR uh, Wallingford did the studies and the boundary conditions went here, and they, oh, sorry, and they went up to Anglesey, and they found considerable increases in the water level in this region here of the, of the order of 30 centimetres. 
And that was of major concern to many of the environmental groups. Anyway, we felt that the boundary conditions needed to be taken much further out. So in our model studies, to start with, we went right up to here and we took them much further out here. Then my colleague went to a conference in, uh, in Southampton and the person from Oxford at Adcock had um, presented saying that the boundary conditions need to go out right out to the, to the continental shelf. Uh, our model was already taking a considerable amount of time to run. I, I wasn't convinced of that, but then he said to me, he said, ah, oh, one of the authors is uh, Borthwick. I thought, ah, oh, better look at this much more seriously. I have huge respect for Alistair Borthwick, who's now moved from Oxford to Ireland. Anyway, uh, we looked at this carefully, and lo and behold, we, found, we were expecting, I said, we look at this carefully, so we ran our model right out to the continental shelf and used those continental shelf boundary conditions for our Irish sea model. And we found, lo and behold, we did not get the same results. So we ended up with the same conclusions as the work of Alistair Borthwick and uh, Adcock. I don't remember his first name, sorry. Anyway, we then found out that the STPG scheme gave us, with our continental shelf model, the same, pretty well the same conclusions that we would have far field effects in the Irish Sea and in the Morecambe Bay area. This is showing you the difference between the case with and without the barrage. And here you can see why, because we're chopping off a considerable chunk below the tidal, of the bottom half of the tide. And then we ran it for the two-way generation with no sluices, the new scheme. Not quite the new scheme in terms of the turbines. But now we find that we've got no far field effects outside the estuary. So this is another advantage of this scheme. In other words, if we go ahead with the turbine, the Havering Power Scheme, then there are no far field effects outside the estuary in the Bristol Channel. The estuary ends pretty well where the barrage is, and the Bristol Channel ends just about here. So this is a big attraction. And the scheme ends up with the tide where we have the full uh, turbines <coughs> capacity in, uh, very similar upstream to the existing tide. Now we look at some plots. We have uh, water levels here without and with the barrage. This is for ebb generation only. And then if we go to, uh, and then if we go to the currents, we see that the old scheme has a considerable reduction in the currents. Here you can see red is very, very strong currents in this estuary. You see very little yachting in this estuary. The currents are far too strong. If we build the barrage with the ebb generation only, the currents drop off dramatically, both upstream and downstream of the barrage, and therefore it would open up the estuary dramatically to recreational opportunities. It will transform the estuary. It would be like taking Britain and moving it to Saudi Arabia. If we build the barrage according to the Havering Power Scheme, we don't change conditions upstream very much. We basically just phase the tide, but we get almost the same amount of power out of the estuary. And now the current is almost the same as before, not significantly different, uh, which is what the NGOs want. They don't want us to change the ASHI characteristics significantly. And then we can look at flooding effects without sluices, with sluices, and we can look at the effects. This is, uh, sorry, some of the titles have come off here. This is 2145. This is, a, this is at the end of the life of the barrage, theoretical life of the barrage, 120 years into the future. And one of the big problems in the UK is this area here, Somerset Levels. And if we build a bund here, we can remove the flood risk of this uh, bund area, as you can see from this plot here. This is an area that is considerably prone to flooding. So here you can see that the barrage can be used to protect, barrage and a bund combination can be used to protect not just from uh, flooding, but also from sea level rise and surge effects. Then we look at suspended sediments. This estuary has very high levels of suspended sediments and turbidity. We modeled here both cohesive and non-cohesive. If we uh, build a barrage with ebb tide generation only, then we reduce the suspended sediment levels quite considerably. If we build a barrage with the HP scheme, then we don't see this dramatic reduction in the suspended sediment levels, as you'd expect again. The other point is that the government at the moment only look at levelised costs over a 30-year period, which is quite damaging when you talk about the cost and the strike price of the barrage. So wind, for example, is costed at 30 years and so forth. And when we compare things at a 30-year cost, then things become quite expensive for the barrage because we have to pay for the wall. And it takes typically 30 years to pay for the wall. 
But once you've paid for the wall, then the barrage becomes the cheapest form of electricity, as you find when, if you go to Laurence, for example. The French will tell you that the barrage in Laurence now produces the cheapest electricity anywhere in their system. <clears throat> and then we look at one of the biggest problems we face in UK in terms of sustainability, and that is the challenge of the southeast of England. Almost every graduate we have coming through Cardiff in my experience, wants to go to the southeast of England because that's where they think the job opportunities are. Every one of my three children ended up in London to start with. Uh, alternatively, they may want to go back to where they live in, in, uh, in Wales or wherever. But most of my students end up wanting to go to London because, and you ask them why they want to go to London, they say that's where the jobs are. You then ask the companies, consulting engineers for example, why have you set up your head office in London? And they say to you, that's where the best graduates are. That's where the best people are. So it's a chicken and egg situation that everybody's moving all the time to this part of London. So we have a high water stress problem. So I've had a lot to do with Boris Johnson, for example, now the mayor of London. And the best engineering solution to this problem is to raise the dams in Wales and to release water under drought conditions. There was a big challenge last year of drought. Release water under drought conditions, canal it across to the Thames, and then take it down through the, through the Thames can, uh, River to, from the top of the Thames down to the southeast of England. There are many papers on this in the Royal Academy of Engineering. But that really is not a sustainable solution because if you pump more and more water down the river, you're going to attract more and more companies to the southeast of England, etc., etc., and more and more graduates are going to flock to the southeast of England. Last year, the BBC moved up to Salford. It's a disaster, and everybody in the BBC says the biggest mistake we ever made was to move to Salford. Nobody wants to go there. And then the better solution is to try to make that part of the UK, which has the least water stress, more attractive so that we get people moving to that part of the UK where we have less water stress. And when you look at that map, you see it's Bristol. <coughs> Bristol is a small city, 400,000 people. You could double it in population, it's still a small city with 800 million, uh, sorry, 1,000 people. So why aren't people moving to Bristol at the moment? Because there's no catalyst to attract them there. So the barrage, in my view, offers more than just a renewable energy uh, op opportunity. It offers the catalyst to attract people to the Bristol conurbation. And you drive along the M5 from Western to Ch Cheltenham, which is pretty well all along the side, southwest side of the, uh, of, of the estuary, and, <clears throat> and you are basically in barren terrain where you have plenty of opportunities to locate small companies, IT companies, for example. So I believe that this project will offer huge opportunities to develop this region along here as well. So, in summary, the SEM barrage with the low head turbines would provide 5% of the UK's electricity from renewables. The new scheme would reduce uh, intertidal habitats by 50 square kilometres vis-à-vis 140. I noticed my earlier slide said 14 instead of 140. Uh, it would reduce the flood, flood risk upstream and combat the area a huge area with major cities like Cardiff, for example, against sea level rise. It would reduce to varying degree the tidal currents and suspended sediments, depends how you operate the turbines. It would increase light penetration and water quality. It will change the ecology in the benthic flora and fauna, and it will enhance the opportunities for tourism and recreation quite considerably. We've seen that in Laurence, and the op this is a much bigger project than Laurence. The two-way generation offers the opportunity for optimal provision and minimum hydro-environmental change, and the NGOs don't want environmental change. Um, it will create jobs in the southwest and Wales post-barrage. Post we will have Port, uh, of Talbot, Port Talbot developed enormously for construction of the barrage, and then will leave us with a legacy of a deep water port. Uh, we still have the problems with fish. It is a migratory river. Okay, thank you very much.